Thanks, Meg. And thanks, Power to Fly. Carissa, I just got to say, it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually today. I'm really excited for this conversation. And of course, this is a very special month. I want you to just, you know, rock the mic, you know, let us know how we can support, um, share stories, you know, let's let's shake up, you know, what we are, what the, what the norm, what the social norms have, you know, built in front of us. Let's shake it up. Let's rebuild. And I just want to pass the mic back to you <laughs> as Meg did a beautiful introduction, but I know um, that, you know, I would love to hear more about your, your story just to kick us off. Anything you want to share to get us kicked off? And then I'll move into the questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for that wonderful intro, Meg. Um, Mariella is very excited to also have a chat with you today. And thanks to the, to the Power to Fly team for this opportunity to chat with you all today. Um, I think I, the only thing I will add um, in terms of my experience, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into a lot more of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, but something I also am very proud of is my work for the AAPI, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander community specifically in 2020, when some of you, the uprise of uh, racialized attacks, xenophobia and such uh, were happening against the Asian American community with the pandemic. Um, I had bond, uh, worked together with two partners, Shang Xiao Yu and Julia Berryman. Shang Xiao is a social justice educator. Julia is a, um, Julia Berryman is a, somatic healer um, and creativity coach, and really wanted to create this holistic program to help Asian Americans really understand our own racialized identity through looking at the historical activist lens for the Asian community, again, and contextualizing what's going on today um, with this also more uh, emotional intelligence side and piece of like just understanding what's going on and processing, as well as healing from, again, that more embodiment and somatic standpoint. So. Uh, I was really proud of creating that, um, co-creating that with the team um, and being, uh, unfortunately, fast forward to today, where again, there's been an uptick, especially with violence against our elders um, and being able to provide a space, a community, uh, a place for learning um, and healing and support. And so I'm also just really proud of that, that group and, and that, that work that we're doing for the, for the Asian community beautiful. And before we get kicked off, I know that I would say that would be the first thing we do, but I want to make sure that folks can follow you, you know, support the great work that you're doing. Can you just uh, mention your website, how you prefer to be connected with, and then we'll, we'll roll into the questions. Yeah. So my website's consciousexchange.com. Um, the program I just saw, the community I just spoke about is called Arise. It stands for Asian American Racialized Identity and Social Empowerment. Um, so you can look at us, you can find us on um, Instagram at Arise Community. For that as well. Um, my personal is, or my Instagram is conscious exchange underscore. And then also I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So just Carissa Begoni on LinkedIn. Awesome. So let's jump right into these questions. I love that your LinkedIn says, I help uh, people of color and white allies liberate from societal expectations, build their own businesses and design a life of purpose. So just reading this, uh, beautiful manifesto that you have. It just, it, it helps me to remember some folks that I look up to, uh, some of my idols, such as James Baldwin, uh, Josephine Baker, o Oprah Winfrey, Alan Watts, like these these folks who stepped outside of the, the norm um, to look for something that filled them up and also that they could use uh, their work as a service. Um, so I just want to know a little bit more about your career journey and how you became interested in diversity and inclusion, because I feel like if we just had more folks who were, you know, willing and able to, to, to challenge the norm um, and from a place of love and kindness as well, that we would have more, you know, uh, we would have more uh, artists in the world to create the technology, for example, that would help us come together to create, you know, the, the working experience that, you know, we can innovate uh, and help people come together. Tell us more about your career journey. Yeah. I, first of all, love that you are bringing up artistry. That is something I'm a very spiritual person and creativity and artistry. I think in my past, I would never have called myself an artist or, or creative. Um, and I'm very much starting to claim that today. I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, but thank you for even just talking about that because you're right. I think some of the folks that I am really uh, admire right now are like Adrian Marie Brown, Sonia Renee Taylor, and this idea of imagining something different, right? And I think that's, we do need creatives and artists to help us dream about what is possible. We're in a very different time in diversity, equity, inclusion than just pre-2020, right? Um, and I think the challenge is, you know, we're so used to this, you know, colonized <laughs> capitalistic model that um, really when following some of those like Adrian Rue Brown and this idea of reimagining what is possible, I was like, yeah, we're just living someone else's imagination. So why couldn't we recreate that? But that's really hard. 
right now. And I think it's going to take the creativity of the artist and that again, that in, um, just like creativity to, to think about it differently. Um, and that's a lot of what I am pushing folks in the DEI space to, to think about as well. Um, but in terms of my own journey, uh, I, I want I say that I fell into this work. I, and really not really, because as a spiritual person, that, you know, that's not entirely true. <laughs> I think there things happen for a reason. I believe that. Um, and I am grateful that I believe that I found my calling and my purpose relatively early on in my career, if you will. Um, and have just been really following that instinct for, for some time now. Um, but I think a lot of people who get into diversity and inclusion work, um, it's very personal. And I think a lot of people want to do that today. And I, a lot of folks that I know who have maybe been doing this for some time are like, we don't, we actually don't want to do this. <laughs> it's, it's emotionally draining. It is, it is really hard. It feels like a boulder up the hill and we're starting at negative zero, you know, um, so uh, yeah, but uh, the way I got into it more formally is um, I had been doing this work uh, as the head of diversity and inclusion for Zappos in 2016. Um, and where that kind of came from is I, I had earned my seat at the table prior, a few years prior, I found myself being the youngest and the newest to the company. It was the, the, the woman, uh, the person of color. And, you know, I gave, my, I gave myself a pat on the back. I was like, good job, Chris. <laughs> but I also started to realize I think like any, in any workplace, it doesn't matter how progressive that, you know, like where are the other, where is everybody else, you know? Um, and was really looking for just support and in this new leadership role that I was taking on. Um, and so what I, I had really much identified with uh, uh, in my, with my gender identity at that time. And so I really was looking for other female leaders at the company to lean on again and, and to, um, to just to be in community with. And so I started a women's group at Zappos first when I was still in my, my role, which was, was more operational and strategic at the time. And I was running like programming, like a, it effectively was an ERG for women, um, just doing some like events, community kind of um, events and, uh, you know, fireside chats and such with like some internal leaders. And it was awesome that I got to just meet again, a lot of uh, female leaders at the company who, again, I, be I developed really deep relationships with. And then over, you know, course of a year and a half or so after kind of doing that on the side, I started to realize like I was kind of bored with doing what I was doing operationally for some time and wanted to move into the human side of business instead of in, in that operational side. And eventually I ended up pitching uh, to uh, the late Tony Shea and, and the C-suite, hey, like, I, I think we need a formal DEI office um, and I want to run it. <laughs> and, and they gave it to me. And then I had immediate imposter syndrome. Like, what am I doing? Um, and so I went back to school. I took some grad classes and such. And in that experience, it was really when I started to dig into my own cultural racialized identity. Um, I had real, I covered some stories about my, my own life um, and my first experience was when I was a child, when I was about nine years old um, and I was on vacation with my family in the happiest place on earth, Disney World, right? And I was in the hotel pool and a little white boy came over and said, I don't wanna swim in a pool with Chinese people. And I had two thoughts. One, I am not Chinese, I'm Filipino. And two, what's wrong with that? Like what's wrong with either? And I remember Mariella just being, you know, people have different flight or different trauma or threat responses, right? Fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Mine's fight, <laughs> quite feisty. But I remember I did freeze in that moment, but I was, the, the emotion I was carrying was rage. I was so angry. Um, and to the point where I was like, this kid needs to go, meaning like I was like, this guy I'm like, needs to drown and his so his parents, because that's where he gets it from. And I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say that today, but I mean, as a child to know that, to be that emotionally charged um, and fast forward with stoic Asian parents, we didn't talk about emotions in the household, right? And so I, I actually internalized that my entire life up until probably that moment. Now, you know, I was probably in my early thirties at that point with that role. And so, and so what, 20 years ish of my life as I had no idea how it was actually, that incident was impacting me subconsciously. And I was intentionally distancing myself from my Filipino culture. I was intentionally, you know, probably, I think I have a, I have a quite a, I can have an assertive personality and a bold personality. I wonder sometimes how much of that is natural and how much of that has been conditioned, you know, from that experience of saying, hey, I never want to be othered again. I never want to feel less than again, 
right? I have, I have visible tats on, on my, on my arms. And sometimes I roll those things up. I drop my, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Here's my New York skyline. But I, you know, I, some of those peacocking things, right. To compensate for like, again, I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm seen as other or less than, and maybe overcompensating in some ways for that. So um, that was some really interesting kind of revelations in my journey. And then even just starting from that point, right. Even looking at, I, Yes, I had the formal role in 2016, but I had been doing this for some time. I won a, I won a national contest with MTV. This thing was called For Your Mind. I think I was like in sixth grade or something <laughs> when that happened. And then I started a multicultural club in my high school. I was part of, I interned at the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office in my col- in, in university. Um, my first job out of college at Macy's, I was in the buying offices with, you know, they mass hired, they had done, um, like a merger and they had mass hired a bunch of essentially folks out of college. And I had a role, I was surrounded by a bunch of 20 year olds and they were launching these ERGs at the time. And I started an ERG for millennials before millennials was even a thing, not even a term, right? So I, yes, I have been doing this again informally, maybe only for what, five-ish years or so, but this has been following me my entire life. And I only really became conscious of it because of that role. And I'm so grateful for it. And then I said, again, uncovering that this is a mission. This is something that you were born to figure out and and support people with. Um, And then fast forward again into the work I'm doing, particularly for the Asian community. You know, when, when in 2020, when um, these attacks were starting to happen again, it really triggered in me. I was seeing people my age, my friends, like talking about their racialized experiences now. I never used to hear, it was just me who was always like, mouthing off about like the racism that I experienced, right? Whether that was verbally in the workplace and discrimination or lastly, unfortunately, I I was physically attacked. Um, And so, you know, here I am talking about all this and now I'm seeing my friends talk about it. And that was deeply painful, but more, even more painful than hearing my friends starting to vocalize some of their traumas and experiences from even maybe childhood was now that their children are experiencing it. And to hear that their kids were experiencing, you know, racial slurs and such on the bus or in the classroom, um, that brought me right back to my nine-year-old self. And I was like, oh, no, 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 this is not okay. You know, and if they, if my friends are not prepared to have these conversations because they didn't have, like myself, have these conversations with our parents, right? And then now these children are going to grow up with this and not be able to process, emotionally process or... Um, and, 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 and talk through this, then we're going to continue this <laughs> generational trauma. I was like, no, we're not. And so I, I created a rise out of that, you know? Um, and so that's, that's a little bit of <laughs> that, that journey. This is, this is lifelong work. And I, I don't see myself um, moving away from it anytime soon. Wow. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for, for diving in on your beautiful journey. Uh, I know that folks need to hear this. Uh, As we were speaking in the green room, storytelling uh, is key for uh, just putting a big, beautiful solve on the wound that is what you're saying, the trauma of colonization, essentially. I mean, you know, not sugarcoating it at all. Um, And if if folks have heard me interview uh, people on on Power to Fly these days, you know that I I speak often about digital colonization. So I would love to hear what you think. I mean, because what I hear from you is, you know, um, allyship, uh, advocacy, you know, having the initiative uh, to to make space at the table, but also start your own table. You know, like maybe don't wait for people to say, hey, yeah, okay, we're looking for you. Been looking, you know, to diversify the room. It's like, how can I start my own initiative based on, you know, me um, walking through the door of, of my past traumas, essentially? I mean, I, I live in Argentina now, and I love that folks can show up late. Grown-ass people can show up late to something really important, say, sorry, I, my, my therapy ran a little over, and nobody judges them. Nobody judges them. Nobody looks twice. But in the States, there's this taboo about, like, working with things that you and, – and in the States, look at all of the isms. Look at all of the isms that we have to work through. So, folks, if you learn nothing else from Carissa being so transparent and vulnerable and sharing just a piece of her beautiful story – you know, it's about turning in. And I love that the, the, the DEI space allowed you to do that. Um, 
because I, I, I have so many questions that I'm not even going to look at right now because I just want to unpack a lot of things that you were speaking about. Um, because I, like I said, stories like this, we need to unfold them more and more. Um, I would love to hear your opinion because a couple of years ago, you know, the DEI space probably didn't exist. I mean, it exists, it existed, but not in the extent, not at the capacity that we see now. So I see, I would love to hear any like, you know, flags that you want to warn people of for, you know, people want to get into this space, but I don't know that people are necessarily willing to do the work that it takes. Like you said, that big boulder that you're starting at negative and you have to push it up and it's, you know, it's a lot of work. I would love to hear you give some tips and tricks and, you know, maybe some things to avoid as you've learned in your experience on, you know, how we can truly move the needle here in this DEI space. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to remember is there is no playbook, right? We're in a very different time and to to definitely utilize and leverage that imagination. Um, a couple things that you were touching on are, um, uh, I'll guess some flags that I'll say are when I first started this role, I, I, oftentimes a lot of us are on our own, right? Um, and trying to push that boulder up a hill by ourselves and internally. Um, so just kind of in terms of how I look at all the work that I do, I look at it having different tables, right? One being the career table. Are you climbing the ladder? Because as a woman of color, very quickly understood things like, I, I didn't see it at first until I was at the table that, oh, oh, this is what the bamboo ceiling is. And that's the bamboo ceiling different from the glass ceiling. You know, it's, it's, it's what Asians kind of uh, run up against in terms of our ability to move into leadership roles because we're not seen as leaders in a Western perspective, right? Um, and so, but I do think there's liberation there, right? How do you climb? And I do think representation is important. It's not the only thing though, right? The other table then was, I did have this experience in diversity inclusion, um, which I think until you're sitting in that seat internally, you don't realize <laughs> Um, I think like a lot of folks now are asking, asking me about, you know, how do I get into this space? I was naive about, hey, I'm just going to help people, right? This, everyone wants to help people. <laughs> and uh, the spectrum of uh, ideas and um, perspectives around what equity meant and what justice or not even, we were talking about justice liberation in pre-2020. So what just equity even diversity even meant um, and getting, you know, being seen, right? And getting you know, what you're looking for taken care of um, was so large. And I, 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 it had tunnel vision, I think as well. And I, I'd admit that. Um, and something else I think I missed too was not knowing and not having an, an entire community. And that includes mental health and mental wellness support from therapists or coaches or whatnot, not just peers. Um, and realizing the importance of that. And I think if you look at, you know, movement spaces now and activists, they talk so much about community care. It's not just about self-care, but community care, right? Because ultimately, um, if you think about what DEI means, it's so broad. You know, what are we, what are we doing here, right? Like, there's no way I can actually be uh, an expert at all things from a cultural identities perspective, but, and, and, and the intersections of that as well, but from a functional standpoint, when we're talking about being in, in, turn, in a company, I spent most of my time in strategy and operations, right? Looking at financials and such. Um, I'm not, I didn't spend 15 years in marketing. I didn't spend 15 years in HR or recruiting or what other, you know, ways in which we're looking at diversity. So uh, uh, of course there needs to be many people. And like, you know, what I find beautiful today is as now I've solved for that beautiful community, support system, therapists, coaches. I have an, I joke with my friends. I have an army of people who support me in my, in doubling down on self-care because this is so emotionally exhaustive um, and physically that I have people to, to lean on. Um, and uh, yeah, that community care is so important. And what's been beautiful, even in digital spaces, that the community is all really willing to help each other. There's not this competition, right? We have different expertise, different lenses. Um, and I have found such support in just, in, uh, I think when we think we have to move things forward by ourselves, it can be really daunting, but I've definitely been leaning on other folks recently and seeing how I feel really safe and really um, comfortable saying, I gotta pass the baton for a second. I gotta take a break. I gotta sit on the sideline and to take care of myself and trusting that I can pass it to someone who's going to take that torch up for, for, for that moment. Cause then we're probably going to switch back. Right. Um, or otherwise collaborate on, on such. So um, I really do think don't, don't neglect that self-care, that community care. Um, and then again, this idea that 
there isn't a playbook. There are, you know, we're beyond unconscious bias. There is, it's overt racism at this point, right? And so we've never, I've never been able to talk so um, openly and directly about, specifically about the identity of fear around race, right? And so that's, um, that's really new, I think, in this time. Absolutely. I hope that we can continue this conversation after this because we only have like a little bit over five minutes left and we haven't even cracked open the, the egg yet to just let everything out. I love it. But we're, all, we're, we're getting it heated up. I like, I like it a lot. Um, I also applaud the work that you do, the vision that you have on, you know, making it more of a holistic experience, you know, bringing the community in, um, you know, and not the... F- I, I don't even know if this is a term, but I'm just going to say it now, this false connection, this false community, you know, I feel like social media definitely is playing a hand on thinking that we are building communities, but really we're just building more separation. Um, so just to be aware of that as well and having that emotional intelligence to be self-aware, you know, to practice self-regulation, empathy, um, you know, to be uh, socially responsible as well. So with that said, I want to kind of switch gears here and talk a little bit about business, you know, and, and, and taking up space in the financial world as, you know, people of color. So so do you have any advice for BIPOC or female entrepreneurs who are trying to decide what kind of businesses they want to create in this time and feel free to, you know, make it very specific for, you know, Asian American month that's happening now. I know that lots of things are, you know, on our radar, but we just, we would love your direction on like how we can support, how we can be aware, how can we educate each other and ourselves just to build a better community? Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, it was divine connection that you and I were put together when I was hearing the description of you as, you know, talking about emotional intelligence. That is something that I've been talking about for DEI, even when I was at Zappos. This is why I was very adamant that that was a skill set that I think we all needed, because how am I going to even believe or that there's a lived reality that's, it could be so different from mine that that's actually possible if I'm not even comfortable with my own story, right? And I think you probably know what we learn in EQ, it's, it's really a lot about awareness, where it is of self, our bodies, how we're experiencing, you know, emotions, not just again, mentally, uh, but physically, um, and, and also seeing how it's playing out for other people, right? That empathy. Um, so in terms of start, you know, starting a business, you know, oftentimes I think people are like, really, I don't know. I know I don't want this, right? But then I ask, well, what do you want, right? When we talk about values aligned businesses too, they want to do things, something that's meaningful in their career or start their own, their own, um, their own business that again is values aligned. And I ask, okay, well, what are your values? And often I'm met with a blank stare, like, uh, you know, sort of no, uh, maybe, but, and follow up that with Carissa, I've, I've actually never spent a lot of time to even think about it. And yes, in a capitalistic, like colonized world when we're, everything is hustle and grind and move fast. Um, we haven't had time to pause, to think about what it is that we really want. And so the first question, how do you even move into a values aligned business? I mean, what are your values? And it's funny because we all, you know, especially if we're leaving or trying to leave our nine to fives, right? We see our, a lot of our companies, you know, that those values are on our badges, right? They're on the walls and blazoned on our company handbooks, right? So how we, and, they, and decisions are made off of those values with that being like your North Star, right? And so it's no surprise to me when I speak to individuals who are trying to do their own thing and don't know where to start. And it's like, well, what are your values? And if they don't have it, it's like, okay, so it's no, it's no wonder to me that we're feeling lost or confused or uncertain, right? And this is the same thing. So whether you're starting a business or just again, speaking up, standing up, a lot of the conversation too, again, for the AAPI community right now is, you know, like I'm getting asked, like, how do I speak up for myself or advocate for myself or advocate for my community? Um, how do I have cross-racial dialogue with folks? And like, okay. Right. Again, the awareness of self and stories and what's what I really believe, hey, it, our, our confidence comes from conviction and conviction comes from a deep, deep knowing. And that knowing comes from awareness. Right. So, again, we take it back to EQ. It's I, I take people a lot of my programming, a lot of the work I do initially with clients, both group companies. And I actually just came from a company <laughs> workshop that I just conducted. And I take people through this and it seems really fuzzy and introspective and kind of like, what, what's going on here? Like, like you're going to tell me how to power pose or something and, and how to, you know, <laughs> do my Ted talk. And I'm like, listen, you have to go internal first. You know, we are so quick to say, Hey, these are the strategies you need to implement. Hey, these are it's always outside of ourselves, right? What's the tangible and tactical and external things we do. But a lot of that is driven internally and we skip that piece. And I, I'm really asking, inviting people to come back to that, that inter, internal drive. What are the stories? What motivates you? Like I said, if I didn't know what was going on, 
uh, when I was nine and I didn't understand that story. I wasn't aware of that story. How, you know, what do, do I think I would have that same confidence that I do today? No, I don't. Right. And I could, I unpacked all those different stories from now or from then until, you know, even until today. So, yeah. Beautiful. I love that you're the, the reflection, the reflection part of this is, you know, to, to start from within and move without. So let's assume that someone has done the internal work. Can you take the last two minutes? Uh, we've got about three minutes in total, but I'd love for you to, you know, take your time on this question within the two minute time frame, and then we'll continue this later um, to go a little external. So let's say I've done the work inside and now I need to, you know, convince people. So this question reads, how can individual contributors convince stakeholders to invest in DEI efforts at their organizations? Yeah. For me, that was strength in numbers, you know? So I paired up with, I, when I first started that women's group, for instance, at Zappos, and even when the one I did at Macy's, right? It wasn't me by myself trying to get it together. I did surveys. I like amassed people. I was having, I was, I didn't ask for permission. I was just like, let's just go, right? And I pinned, I probably started with my friends and closest, like my, my BFS at work. Like, hey, this, do you want to do this? This is interesting to you right? Um, are you experiencing the same thing? So it starts off kind of like small, like just tough, like grabbing, grabbing a friend and that started to grow. Right. And so I think there's strength in numbers. You can get, you activate, right. Again, I, I didn't really ask for permission. I was just like, I can do this thing. Right. Like, it's fine. Let's just go do it. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we stop ourselves from asking, you know, and I think that's what it was going to be a no, if we didn't ask in the first place. So why not just ask? So, um, be, have the courage to, to just go for it and ask and then to um, strengthen numbers, right? Find other people, start small, start to meet people, test things out, right? And then you'll see how that starts to grow and grow. And now you have evidence. Now you've proof of concept in some capacity, right? To come to, to go to your executives and say, hey, this, this really matters and I've already activated it. So what's the problem? Give me some yes. funding. <laughs> yeah, the, give, me, give me that funding. Data, we all know that data is speaking these days. So let's use it to our advantage to create more DEI space uh, at the table. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation. Can you just remind us how we can stay connected with you, your website, your socials, however you prefer us to be connected with you? Because I know that folks have more questions. They probably want to tap into the beautiful work that you're doing as well. So let us know how we can stay connected, Carissa. Yeah, sure. So I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So Carissa Begonia on LinkedIn, I'm pretty easy to find. Go ahead and DM me. I apologize in advance if I don't get back to you. It's been, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind for, for APAM um, this month. Um, and consciousexchange.com, as well as uh, Instagram is consciousexchange underscore and my Arise community. If you are API Asian American identifying, um, it's Arise community uh, on Instagram as well. <laughs> 